All right. So it's not going to mention Ruby. Um, but yeah, welcome to my talk. I'm Floris. That uh, Rebus, it's my name as a visual reminder. So it's flower and person, obviously, is a florist minus the T. That's my name. That's how I do my Starbucks orders and everything. Um, I work for Intercom. I'm a product engineer working on the support side of the business. Um, and I work on mostly like the bot stuff. So whenever like you see a bot, that's probably something I might be doing. And if it's wrong, I'm not doing it. Um, so we're going to talk about tests. Right, we're going to talk about testing, but I first want to get clear on why we're going to talk about testing. Why should we test in the first place? So, story time. Why, why better to start with um, a story where I ruined something, where I screwed up big time, right? So let's set the stage. My previous employer, not Intercom, luckily, um, we did a soft launch of a product, um, and it was a desktop product where people can do like some no-code data science and stuff like that. We had this entire auditorium like this, a uh, bit less people, um, filled out with just random people who were interested in what we we're building. And we decided it was a good idea to load our product up into USB drives and have an executable run on their machines, which uh, that has never gone wrong before, has it? Um, so people showed up and they tried to, to uh, yeah, perform the executable on their machines and uh, it broke. <laughs> for a lot of people because they wouldn't allow the executables, but that was not my issue. So for the people that were able to get the app running, they got me to with a white screen, and that was my fault. So the night before, as we all do at Startup World, like we, we, we scramble, we, we make things work, or we make things not work. Uh, <laughs> and I was on the latter part, so I, I wrote some stuff to, to get these last changes in, and I did write some tests, uh, but I didn't bother writing test that will go through user flow. So back in current day, it was a blank screen, right? And we're like, oh, that's bad. So we, we, we gather all these USB drives back. We figure out what the problem was. And it turns out that one of the lines I changed was actually causing a 404, which was not caught. And because I, I didn't test like a user would, hey. Um, and then <laughs> we found the issue. Um, and we put it back on the USB drive, so we distributed it, and it's all fine. So the moral of this entire story um, bit is no user flows equals big bad. And that's that phase, that was me. Not, not now, I'm just nervous. Um, so beyond that, I want to kind of get a bond line out there as well, like on why testing is important. And there's three things I want to highlight here. And one is testing verifies a program is doing what it's supposed to do. The second is a testing, it, it verifies a program keeps on doing what it's supposed to do. And it's a great way of documenting what you intend your program to be used like. So whoever comes in is actually going to know from your tests, supposedly, that how it's supposed to be used. So it's, it's a great tool for many things, and it, it will solve you from many problems that I went through. Um, so hopefully you won't do that. So we need tests, right? We, we, we got that right. But why everything is, is, got, is, is great. So let's pull up some tests. Um, I got one, two, three, four tests for you here. So Find the smelly code in like three, two, one. Great, got it? Cool. What do these tests have in common, right? Well, they're all not so great tests. And they all live in the intercom code base today. Like these are run. So let me go over them uh, a little bit quicker. Um, so this test here, we are trying to test for um, a locale changer. And as you can see, it does a bunch of internal state checkers. It doesn't really test what the user sees. So, and, and if you really dive into this a bit further, you, you kind of see that, well, one, we're, we're testing for internal state. So that kind of gives us a, a sense of like, okay, maybe it should be a unit test, right? And then we have some other stuff that we don't need to have an entire page running for. Like it might just practically test a component, right? So that could kind of nudge us into an integration test. This one, um, it is a, like a, 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 a way state and a model should pop up. Uh, that's testing it. You can see some leftover development code. I mean, it's nice to to uh, once in a while assert that uh, OK equals true, like that. It's, it's good to have that sometimes, but maybe not here. Um, now we have some duplicated code and uh, a, a run loop, uh, which is not needed in tests anymore, mind you, tests. Um, and it sets some state after we've rendered a component, which is not really what we want to do. Um, same one for this, a um, bit messier because we also um, call 
Amber lifecycle hooks, which kind of beats the whole point of like testing your route, right? Because this is already tested. Like you want to see if it works within your routes. Um, and then the last one, but not the least one, this is um, seeing if an article can still show its history when you just delete all its contents. And you see like halfway through the test, we have some state setters that just set everything to empty, which is not what you want to do. Um, and then another point I want to make, not necessarily related, a bit of a tangent, but never use CSS class to assert for anything. Just don't do it. Separation of concerns, right? Just, just find other stuff. Just anything else but CSS class because they change their views anywhere. It's, it's messy and you break things even though they're not supposed to break. And none of them like test like actual users, right? That's kind of the main point that I'm trying to drive here. Um, so how then do we write a good test, like you might ask, right? I, I, I just said these are terrible or not so great. How do we do them? Well, we'll get there. No worries. But first, I want to talk about the title of the talk, testing as if you're someone in someone else's shoes. So there's kind of a paradigm shift. Instead of like going for all these internal sales things, we really think about a user, like someone who is actually consuming our products, right? Like we all, most of us at least, write applications that are used by actual human beings. So what we want to really test and verify for is that we test for what a human sees, how a human perceives things, how, we, what, how a human interacts with your application, what they click on, etc. So with that, that, that gets a whole whole cascade of, of things that that implies, right? And one of them being like internal state, it, it doesn't matter to a user, right? It, it doesn't matter for us to test on it, especially on the higher level. We don't want to verify against different states. Um, we just want to have the states be reflected in the UI and then test for those. Beyond that, it's a very natural way for us humans to think about other humans, how they interact with stuff. Like that's and the empathy thing, right? Like, we're really good at that. So why don't we just do more of that? And then a last but very important point is it shifts the focus in the body and our effort of testing. And that kind of leads me into the testing trophy. So this, to me, has been mostly made popular by Can't See Dots. There's a lot of Ember talk already prior to this, but I'm very fresh to Ember, so I didn't know. Okay. Uh, but now I know. And in my honest, objective opinion, it's a great visual on where we should put our testing efforts. And there are more t shapes of, of testing distributions, like, like the classic testing pyramid and stuff, but we'll focus on this one. So I have four layers. We have a static foundation. We have a slab of units. We have a big, big unit of integration. And then the cherry or trophy on top of the trophy is the end to end. So that's a lot of stuff, right? That's a lot of things to talk about. So let's do a little breakdown of these different test types. So from the bottom up, we have our static testing. And this is really done before any code runs, right? This is, this gives, like, this captures issues that we, we might not even see by testing. And it, it kind of facts check us on, like, okay, are we doing the right thing here? It builds a foundational layer of confidence that we don't later have to check for. So this usually takes it the, the form of a linter, like, like uh, Ember template lint or, or Eastlint that just comes out of the box with Ember. So we don't really have to worry about this at all. And yeah, you get, you get, you get anti-patterns and stuff. And you also have things like static type checking, like TypeScript is a fantastic tool to just write better software from the get-go. You're not going to find like Boolean C numbers and stuff. You don't want to do that. And that's what TypeScript is going to tell you. So one up is unit testing. So this test, these kind of tests, they cover the smallest unit of code. Um, and that kind of differs between languages and frameworks. But in the Ember world, some of these units are things like services, models, or utility libraries, like stuff that doesn't really need to be rendered onto a screen. Um, and it, it all relies on mocking things up, right? It's, you just test the unit and you make sure you get confidence that the unit on its own works. And these are really cheap to run. So, so we like that. Cheap is good. Um, then one level up, integration testing. This is, this is the main body. This is what I really like. Um, this is where... In the Ember world, we would refer to as rendering tests. So these test components are hierarchy of components. And what is great about that is that you get like fantastic chunks of your application that you can test against user flows or entire feature sets. And because they're they're quite cheap to run, you can you can really like put yourself in the shoes of, of an end user and go through these different flows. And then once you start like tying, like piecing all these things up, you know that these entire chunks of your application already work in and of its own. And you don't necessarily need to check against like a even bigger set of tests, which leads me to end-to-end -end testing. So in Ember world, um, this refers to application tests. Um, the way I think about end-to-end -end is, is a bit beyond that as well. Um, it goes into to the 
to the realms of of like using things like like Selenium or Cypress, where you have all your services running, right? It's, it's, it's essential to to run your some tests like a log and flow or something like that against everything that's running. So to make extra sure that like you don't have anything mocked out and and things just work and you don't push something like I did and you have an anti screen, you don't want to have that. Um, but these are expensive to run, so you want to use less of these and mainly just as a final confidence checkers. But where the real body of everything is should be one layer down the integration test because that's where most of your mimicking of user interactions can actually also happen. And it's cheap. So how does this look like in a UI? Um, this is a screenshot from uh, the Intercom Teammates app. Um, the big green blob is pretty much an end-to-end -end test, right? It's the entire application. So this can be on application tests where you mock some things out or an entire like run in real production kind of environment and then you test against it. And then we have the integration test. So I, I put a bunch of blobs here to kind of really bring home the point that it can be on so many different levels and zoom levels. So you can have a more collective part of the screen where you can also subdivide it into smaller problems to really make sure that like on a smaller integration level, things also work. And then we have the smaller. So unit testing mostly goes to non-rendering things, but I also consider some like like atomic components to be units, but they would be rendered. So it's kind of contradictory to how we think about it in Ember. But I just want to make the point to confuse you. And some <laughs> non-UI things uh, like like these services and models so that I cannot put on a screen and not make it look pretty. So that's that's this. So so take it all in um, and and have a stop. So we're going to digest this a little bit and. Remember these, right? These are the beautiful tests. So let's let's do some refactoring, right? Like I'm not going to write it because I'm not brave enough. Um, I just did before and after screenshots. I hope you're okay with that. So on the on the left you have your before, and on the right you have your after. This is a bit of a chunky one, so I split it up in different highlights areas. So on the top right, that is, um, you can see that I rewrote the left highlighted part into a unit test. Um, and and the giveaways for this were that we're testing against internal state, right? So what does that mean? You dive in. Okay, you see the service is actually changing these things. So why not just test this service, right? So it's a session service that's responsible for these changes. So we we go we pretty much like copy paste everything over. And I made the locale here, for example, a um, a variable. So what we can do, we can also parameterize these tests and just add all the, the, the locales that we want to test for and just batch them all together. And you get a whole lot of unit tests kind of for free. And they run really fast. And you just verify that you see the right behavior for every unit test. Now, the second one is we have our locale switcher. So when we, when we really look at what happened on the application level, uh, on the application level, yeah, um, we visit this this entire page, and we are only testing against the locale switcher component. So why not just use it in an integration test? It's a lot cheaper. It's faster to write anyway, and everybody's happy. So we do a rendering test here. We we render like just suspend belief, right? It's like the the render locale switcher is going to render it. It's going to be great. Um, so we trigger these events, and and one thing to point out here. So most of this is just copied over, but one one very important distinction here is that we check for the actual text that's displayed on the screen because that's what a user sees, right? That's like the user's not going to go into the console and see like, oh, hey, what's what's my actual state on this? Like, like may, we might do that, but but an actual user won't. Um, so that's why I really want to drive home this point that put the text there, like test against the text. Um, the second one. Um, so this is where we want to get like this this like away state and like this this um, modal popping up. So we we downgrade this to an integration test, making it cheaper. Um, we move all the state changes up before we render anything, right? So it is okay if we put our app in a certain state before we render anything, but we should not rely on arbitrary state changes to have like a certain state in the UI reflected. So we just render, and we, I mean, we sadly remove the okay is true. Um, you know, that's okay. It's okay. We'll come back another time. Don't worry. Um, the third one. Um, and I think this is a really good one uh, that kind of describes my point, is that we halfway through just empty the article contents. Like this, no user's going to do that, right? It's, and it's also not going to be, like if a user were to do this, like it would still live on the backend anyway. So haha, bad luck for you. Uh, <laughs> 
So, so we, we go back into this idea of like, okay, what would a user do, right? Like what, what things would a user click on? And I think this is a great case for an application test because we're, we're switching between different pages. So you can see that we go to, to like this edit button, we go into the edit page, we click on the more thing and then we click delete and we, we, we say like, oh, we actually want to delete this. Yes, great. Then we go back to the show page and then we verify that the actual thing is disabled and also notice that the disabled checker is gone so no classes don't do it um, just check for it's not disabled um, and if it that doesn't work just make sure that it works um, <laughs> the last one and not the least one is um, the redirect um, so what we did previously is that we just do arbitrary lifecycle hooks and we don't really want to do that because again it beats the point of what we're trying to achieve here so we set our 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 fake user into the state where it should be redirected they should be redirected and then we visit the url and then we verify that's redirected so this is more of how a user would do it right the user is not gonna dive into ember and be like oh i want to do after model that that's not that's not what they do um so all this all this right um and i don't know you want to get lunch so one thing to take away to lunch with this is that you just always, always, always test this if you're in someone else's shoes and it will make the world a better place. Thank you.